On this episode of Tips from the Top Floor, we'll talk about the touchy subject of ethics in wildlife photography, if it's necessary or even possible to enforce, and how I think about the subject. And I have a special guest, mad scientist photographer Don Komarechka, updating us on his latest crazy experimentations. This episode is brought to you by discoverthetopfloor.com, where you can find some of the best organized and most exciting photo tours and expeditions available today. This fall, we'll go back to Lofoten in Norway to see the amazing landscapes and northern lights. And next year, we'll take us to Kyrgyzstan along the Silk Road and Romania, one of Europe's most beautiful landscapes, where we'll get to see the Carpathian Mountains and Bran Castle well known for its association with Count Dracula. Check it out at discoverthetopfloor.com. This is Tips from the Top Floor episode 835 for Thursday, August the 9th, 2018. Tips from the top, from the top floor, tips from the top, all right, from the top floor. Hey, hello and welcome, it's Chris Mockwart. This is Tips from the Top Floor, the photography podcast. It's, uh, it's, it's the first kind of cooler day in like weeks and weeks of super heat okay it's all relative i know where you live it might be completely different but uh it's yeah it's it's nice <laughs> it's almost fresh we're now in the 20 20 plus range 20 plus celsius range as opposed to the 30 plus celsius range ah <sighs> okay um Let's see, I'm in preparations of the pre-recordings for when I'm going to leave to Ireland. Um, it's it's also uh, it's great that you guys send in questions. Uh, I said it on the last episode, I'm going to repeat it right now. It is, um, yeah, you are, you are why I make this show and uh, it's your questions, your feedback that makes this whole thing uh, worthwhile for me. Um, it's all it's 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 an interesting dynamic because um, sitting here in front of that microphone, kind of all on my own, is uh, it's it gets a bit lonely, you know. I mean, it doesn't make me feel bad, but uh, but it's always nice to get a question in and then start digging for an answer if I don't know it already. Uh, it's yeah, it's a growth thing it's an interesting thing and i need you to help me for the q a episodes and uh, keep your voicemails coming uh, do it right now pa pause the podcast pick up your smartphone record something send it to voice at tfttf.com thank you okay the story of today is uh, something i found on petapixel and it's an interesting uh, thing that I kind of want to discuss here. I don't, I haven't really formed my opinion on it, fully formed my opinion on it, but it's a really interesting thing. And it's been coming, um, um, I've been coming back to this multiple times and it has to do with wildlife photos. And uh, the article starts with an example of what can happen with wildlife photos. And you, you, it opens with this wonderful photo of a parrot snake with a very wide open mouth uh, yeah, just the colors are popping and the snake looks, yeah, like it's it's about to attack. And uh, it's called, there's a mechanism that uh, is called defensive gape. So it's not an attack thing. It's actually, if you uh, talk to biologists, it's a defense mechanism. And it opens the mouth only this wide open when threatened. So to get that great picture of the snake with a gaping wide open mouth... The photographer took the parrot snake and mistreated it, right? Uh, it's, in, it's in the article. The snake was grabbed by the tail and swirled in circles, and then it was gently batted about the head. Gently, okay, but nevertheless. Um, and then that gape is a stress reaction. It's a threat reaction. And the photographer got his photo. I was happy, and it's a great photo. I mean, there's no discussion about that. You look at it, and it pulls you right in. The yellow eye, the big black pupil, the green scales on the snake. It's a beautiful photo. And <clears throat> the article and the article is written by a guy called Paul, Paul Bertner. Uh, he didn't take that photo, but he was present when it was taken, I think. Um, and it, he, he then elaborates on that and says the around that incident over 30 snakes were caught mistreated for photography and then returned to nature somewhere else from where they were caught 
And uh, yeah, Paul Bertner was part of that. And um, I think he was involved providing logistical help. And he, this story seems to have been an eye-opener for him. And let me quote him. Let me quote him here from the article. The tacit approval I gave amounted to an endorsement, and I consider myself as much to blame as those doing the collecting and abuse. These practices are rife with macro photography, uh, rife within macro photography, and one should not expect experience, professionalism, or status to be an indication of a person's ethical standards. Always question whether something needs to be done, and if it doesn't, don't support it, and if it continues, speak up. So, uh, yeah, interesting. Um, oh, more quote. Uh, These experiences helped mold and form my concept of ethical exif. And then he continues, the respect with which we treat wildlife, whether it is a charismatic and emblematic species like a jaguar, the common or underappreciated backyard denizens, or even vilified pest species, our treatment is a reflection of us and our values. Nature, the wild, is a looking glass through which we can gaze upon our own humanity, a mirror to our human nature. Okay, that, that's enough quoting. Um, and while the entire subject of, the, of ethics is kind of a difficult one, and while it keeps changing as new findings emerge, um, Bertner's stance on ethics in animal photography is mostly uh, transparency. So uh, that's that's pretty much what this entire thing is about. So what he did was he made a proposal that he calls ethical EXIF, EE. I mean, we all know EXIF, right? EXIF, that's metadata about a photo, that's like the shutter speed and the focal length and uh, GPS coordinates and all that kind of stuff. With ethical EXIF, Bertner suggests something on top of that, a system to discuss ethical standards that were used during taking of the photo. And it includes information like a health or stress level scale from 1 to 10, uh, where 1 is the lowest amount of impact on an animal's health, and 10 means the animal was dead at the end. Other elements include subject manipulation, uh, time in captivity, translocation, which means was it captured in one location and then released somewhere else. Uh, playback is another element which is a technique that I think is used in bird photography, where like recordings are played to trick birds into different behavior. Might work with other animals too. And this all rings very close to me. On the, on the photo tours that I do, we're often in pristine environments where some part of nature might be endangered. And there's always that chance to leave some form of a footprint that you didn't intend to leave. Um, let's take our Arctic tours as an example. Uh, when I was going to the Arctic for the first time a few years ago, we were on a ship going up the east coast of Greenland. And the, 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 the company who runs that, they were part of an organization called AECO, A-E-C-O, which stands for the Association of Arctic Expedition Cruise Operators. And uh, that association has very clear guidelines when it comes to a lot of things like uh, the environment, like uh, biosecurity, like what you bring into that environment, what you take out of it, uh, like what you can touch, where you can go. And we were made very aware of those uh, regulations, or rules. I think it's not regular, it's rules. Um, what you're not supposed to do, pretty much. And often just, I mean, common sense stuff, right? Like generally, uh, leave no trace principles. We've, uh, if, if you've ever been hiking in nature, um, the leave no trace is just, that's the thing. You're, you're not supposed to uh, yeah, to leave traces. But especially about how to treat wildlife. There's the birds, there's the Arctic fox, there's whales, there's dolphins, walrus, seals, reindeer. Uh, and of course, the polar bears. And, and seriously, things that you wouldn't consider an issue where you live, where you live, might mean life or death up in the Arctic. Uh, the Arctic, that's just an example, right? The Arctic is an extreme environment. And uh, during the cold months, which is 
which is, well, <laughs> the better part of a year. Animals literally fight for their life. And survival up there isn't, isn't easy for them. And being intrusive for the sake of photography can be the decision between life and death for some of these animals. I mean, just imagine low temperatures, minus uh, 20 Celsius, I'm doing a conversion here, minus 4 Fahrenheit. That's pretty normal there. That's nothing unusual. And many of these animals don't really have a lot of reserves, you know? They, they, they are always at the verge of not having enough to eat. So if you intrude, if you stress them, if you interrupt them hunting for food, I mean, just imagine this... <laughs> this polar bear going one way and then it sees you and then it has to go another way to avoid you because that's what their normal reaction would be. Um, if you interrupt their hunt for food, just a simple fact of getting too close to them or flying like flying a drone over them, that might mean that, yeah, instead of following a track to find food, they, they change direction and they go somewhere where there's no food. And simple things like that could mean their death. It, very, very clearly... Um, just from the behavioral change that a photographer's actions would could mean for them. Um, this is just, again, one example of many possible examples. Uh, we did have a polar bear encounter once. Uh, a polar bear was sw swimming through a fjord where, uh, that we were sailing down at this point, and uh, it was hard to notice, right? It was in the water. It you just see the head bobbing out a bit. And uh, when the captain then noticed it, um, uh, it could be easily mistaken for a chunk of ice or something. So uh, when he saw the polar bear, he immediately stopped the engine, let the ship coast slowly. And uh, the bear didn't seem to be stressed, but uh, our friend, my, my friend Mario, who I record the Curiously Polar podcast with, um, he's a marine biologist and I'm... On, on board um, it was very clear that such an encounter is not entirely stress-free for that bear. Did that get, get reflected in any of the photos we took? Mm, I don't think so, no. And uh, th that's just one example. But probably a very harmless one. But now gets back, let's get back to Paul Bertner's suggestion for ethical exif. Now, of course, no such system is without issues. And uh, Bertner is being called out in the comments to his post that this is entirely voluntary and there's no means of verification, which is true, which is totally true. Um, but again, it's a proposal. It's not like, okay, we have to put this in uh, standard, standard metadata fields. You won't find any ethical exif in, in your Lightroom metadata. Um, but discussing ethics in photography, uh, well, it's probably a can of worms and I see a lot of nuance there. Uh, for example, if I want our, our okay, the very different example, if I want our cats to look in the camera, I'll snap my fingers and uh, make sounds to get their attention. Uh, that is some form of manipulation, but does it stress them out? I don't really think so. Does it change their behavior? Well, they're not wildlife, they're domesticated animals with like a full bowl of food waiting for them all the time. So uh, that's certainly different from being like in a wildlife situation where you you rouse the flock of sitting and feeding birds to get a photo of them in the air. Or where you track down a polar bear in the Arctic to get a close-up uh, photo of them. Uh, I've seen photos taken very close up, uh, very close to lions and, and other wildlife uh, with a camera mounted on top of an RC car. So you could drive it up to them and... Again, there's nuance because that was in a in a wildlife park where the animals are used to people being around them in in jeeps. So again, nuance. But the qu the qu question is: Okay, this cannot really be enforced, right? Of course not. It's all voluntary. It is, uh, yeah. It's something that you can't really you can't really enforce. So my personal take on ethical exif. Um, as far as I've thought about it, is I applaud Paul Bertner for making that suggestion. Um, and there is room for improvement, absolutely. Um, and while it would really, it would re really require some serious work to make it this into an, like an overall accepted industry standard with the according metadata fields and 
in your photo apps and so on. I'm all in favor of being more transparent regarding the circumstances of a photo, especially when living beings are involved. And in my eye, a standard for that would be great. Again, can it be enforced? No, it's voluntary. Um, but would such a standard have the potential to raise awareness? Absolutely. I think that's also the main the main point why Paul Werner brought this up. Uh, most people who click the like button on a wildlife photo don't spend any time thinking about the circumstances that that photo has been taken in. And yes, I know the other side of the argument is, but if you reveal too much, the magic goes away and so on. Um, yeah. Would such a standard prevent photographers from taking certain photos? Well, not initially, but if clients who buy those photos demand ethical information, there would certainly be a chance for this to, to influence photographers' behavior over time. But for that to happen, I think we need to discuss things like ethical exit in public and get it out there. No matter how refined it is right now. Uh, at this point, I, th I think it's mostly a vehicle to raise awareness and to get people thinking and talking about it. And I, I would really love your, your opinion on this. I mean, you're, you've been listening to me uh, talk about this now for several minutes. Um, yeah, I've, I've also posted this article like a couple of weeks ago on our uh, tips from the top for Slack in the channel uh, Genre Wildlife. And uh, I think that's a great place to discuss it, kind of within our community. This doesn't have to be out in public, but uh, there are wildlife photographers and I think uh, lots of opinions. So I would love to see like a proper discussion on our Slack. Uh, but feel free to also message me in public on Twitter and other places. Um, but this is pretty much what the Slack is for, right? To discuss something without attracting like the, the haters and so on. So especially with a subject as touchy as this one so i would love to read some of you chime in if you're not on the slack just yet it's free you can get on board at tfttf.com slash y slack w-h-y-s-l-h-c-k and uh, i will also link the genre wildlife channel in the show notes in case you're already on the slack and of course of course let me know your opinion i'd love to hear you chime in right here in the show your voice Record it on your smartphone and send it to voice at tfttf.com. Thank you. This episode is supported by one of my favorite sponsors, WeTransfer. You know, we've all heard about privacy policies in the past month or so, but have you ever heard about a company being proud of their privacy policy? Well, WeTransfer is. They're all about making file sharing easier for everyone. That includes being sure that you don't need to worry about privacy. So they don't sell user data, they don't snoop or spy on files, and they don't want to know your shoe size, soft drink preference, or shopping history. WeTransfer serves ads to keep their service free, but never in that creepy, I was just talking about blenders 20 minutes ago and now I'm seeing ads for blenders kind of a way. In fact, they reserve 30% of their ad space to showcase the work of artists from around the world. It's their way of making the internet a nicer, simpler, and more beautiful place. Start sending files and see what they stand for at we.tl slash not creepy. That's we.tl slash not creepy. You make, we transfer. All right, let's get to our guest. I'm here with Don Komrechka, photographer from Canada. And uh, I think we met back in 2010. 2010 in Toronto. 2010 Toronto on a workshop there. And uh, I've been following what you've been up to. And uh, I was just a guest on your podcast on the Photo Geek Weekly where we it was so much fun i've gotten a lot of positive <laughs> feedback on that by the way <laughs> that is cool um and it's in a title we geeked out about uh, stuff like this new sony 84 megapixel smartphone sensor and nikon's mirrorless camera teaser and the rumors around that and stuff uh and i think i wouldn't be wrong in saying that you, you you're kind of a photographer who loves experimentation you've been playing with a lot of interesting things i probably even go as far as to call you like a mad scientist of photography if that's a term well, that i'll take that could... as a compliment yeah <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you, 
you're, you're, and, and you have the hair for it as well. So, <laughs> oh, if I if I brush it back, it looks like I've had electricity running through my veins. Very cool. Um, so let me let, let me try to to just just touch on a few of the topics that you've been uh, dealing with. I think the one um, that that you started a while ago is uh, you made use of the cold winters in Canada, <laughs> which is where you're from. Winter is intolerable for me. The the my my work uh my photographic work during the winter months makes it ever so slightly more manageable. Okay, so and and that's what you did. You made the best out of the cold winters by uh d diving deep. I think we talked about this on 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 the show quite a while ago. A few years ago, yeah. About uh, your snowflakes photography. Um just 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 briefly, what what is the, the thing that you're doing there? So, uh, well, it, first of all, it's interesting to know how far you can take uh, the same subject into many different directions, because um, photographing a single snowflake is a, is a difficult task. I mean, it's small. The biggest ones might measure a centimeter or so, but most of them are a fraction of that, a millimeter, maybe three millimeters at most. Um, so magnification is key. Most macro lenses can't get that kind of magnification. There is a few of them on the market. Canon famously has their MPE 65 millimeter macro. Uh, Venus Optics, uh, they've got their Laowa series of lenses. They're just about to release, if it's not shipping already, uh, a lens that gets to those same magnifications as well for other camera mounts does that, too. So, does that already count into the microscope, mi microscope territory? Yeah, well, you can get a microscope objective that's a 5x, even less than that. So mm -hmm. anything that's more than one-to-one -one life size, I guess we could consider it uh, micro photography rather than macro, but we just all call it you know, macro or extreme macro just to keep things simple. Um, but I have even used up to a, a 20 times microscope objective to photograph the smallest snowflakes at a fraction of a millimeter across. <laughs> Is and, that, uh, do you do that handheld? No, you don't. I, yeah, no, I did it handheld. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, and uh, when well, I was trying to figure out what puzzle pieces to fit together to mount that uh, that objective on my camera, uh, I was uh, you know referencing some forums, and the people were saying, "Well, yeah, this is the gear that you need, but it it can't be done. You know, uh, what you're trying to do is going to be impossible. Good luck." Um, and uh, yeah, first time out, it was, wasn't so much of an issue. Uh, the most difficult thing that I've done, but it was accomplished. Um, and uh, it's not such a far stretch because I've been shooting up to 12 to 1 magnification for a few years reliably. Um, but what was even more fun is that I found these guys discussing my images because um, I had posted it on Flickr and they found it on that form and they were debating whether or not I had actually done what I claimed. And that, that in and of itself oh, did, was Did they think they were like 3D renders? Well, or they, they they thought that I was lying about doing it handheld. Okay. Mm. Um, mm, so well. anyhow, I, I was I was happy. I was happy to see that controversy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Chris, you know, I've been photographing snowflakes for, I mean, uh, almost as long as I've been a professional photographer. Um, and uh, was it two years ago? I put out a a big poster print that allowed me to um, put all of my snowflakes in one place. But the interesting thing about the Canon MPE 65 millimeter lens is it records its magnification factor in a hidden area of EXIF data called <gasps> Maker Notes, and I can pull that out. Ooh. And, and if I know the magnification factor, uh, and I know the physical size of the camera sensor and the number of pixels across it, I can measure the and number the focus of distance. pixels per millimeter. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and uh, so then I can measure all of my snowflakes. So I put all of them together in relative size to one another, all awesome. to scale. And uh, that poster project took me 2,500 hours to create across five <laughs> years if you look into the total number of effort for every one of those images. Um, and I got to thinking, well, how do you take this even farther? Last year, I, um, I had photographed a snowflake on the front side, and then I flipped it over and photographed the back side. How do you And do over that? the ensuing, well, with a tiny little paintbrush. You, and most you, and, of the time, it needs to be cold. <laughs> yes, it does. And, uh, and so I was, um, uh, I was just, you know, uh, frustrated and trying to find new ways to, to deal with things and, uh, I, uh, I then realized I can make a 3d model of this snowflake. I know what's on the front, what's on the back and what's inside from the, the understanding that I have of it. And, uh, and from that point forward, I started working with a 3d designer. We made a 3d model. We printed it as Christmas ornaments. That's and awesome. uh, did you, did you do any, any uh, photogrammetry on that or was it more like uh, modeling the whole thing? 
Well, it was it was more modeling um, because it, it's it's a transparent subject, so it's hard to yeah. uh, to do photogrammetry on something like that. But um, we did uh, a an anatomically correct version of that snowflake, made it in different colors <laughs> of, of plastic and sterling silver, um, and even the uh, the Royal Canadian Mint has put some of those snowflakes on uh, limited edition silver coins. That so is cool. <laughs> And I'm I'm sitting here thinking, how the heck can I take this farther? Because I, I want to keep doing it, but I got to keep it fresh and interesting. Well, one one thing that uh, stuck in my mind is that some of those uh, snowflakes, when when there are thin layers of ice on them, you get this interference uh, that creates colors, which almost looks like the colors on top of a puddle that had some oil in it. That's the same um, physics at play. That's, that's, that's the same, same effect, yeah. So, so very cool thing. Um, you went uh, from the snowflakes to freezing bubbles. How did that well, come as, along? As one does. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, the, the freezing soap bubbles are something that I had seen other people doing and thought, you know what, I can take my own creative flair to, uh, to just taking this orb of ice, uh, you know, maybe a couple of inches across, um, or of, of liquid that then slowly turns into ice, and uh, and create something that is like much larger snowflakes, but it's got like a crystal ball fantasy feel to it. Uh, and the process is pretty simple. I just backlight it with a flashlight that's, um, I guess you would call it dark field illumination. It's just outside of the frame so that the background stays dark, but all of the light is interacting with the crystals to make them just glow beautifully. Uh, anywhere between minus 8 and minus 20 degrees um, Celsius is probably the ideal scenario with absolutely no wind uh, for that subject. <laughs> and uh, and then you just, uh, you know, you, you blow a bubble. Uh, the bubble solution that, um, again, I can't take credit for, I, I found it online, was six parts water to two parts just plain dish soap and one part white corn syrup. Corn syrup? And the white corn syrup, it's, it's an interesting ingredient because if you don't add that, the bubbles will almost always pop on impact with the snow. And so if you have white corn syrup, and specifically if you're blowing it through a drinking straw, so you can kind of dangle it at the end of the straw and place it where you want, the white corn syrup will pool at the bottom of the bubble and act oh. like a cushion so it'll prevent it from popping when it makes contact with the snow. <laughs> okay. Um, and those photos, by the way, if someone's listening and want, if, if anyone wants to see the photos while we talk about them, uh, your website is at doncom.com, right? D O N K O M dot C O M. Uh, yeah, wait, or dot C A. Uh, the dot com I have as well, and it just goes there. So, all right. D O N K O M dot C A. So that's winner, but it's not always winner. It's uh, sometimes... I, I got to take the mad scientist approach into the warmer seasons as well. <laughs> so you, so, you did some, some 3D stuff, right? Well, and 3D stuff. I, I've even done it with the, the freezing soap bubbles, which is just beautiful because you can differentiate the front from the back and it, it just, it quite literally does add another dimension. And uh, it's funny to think about 3D photography as something that um, that is new or exciting. It's existed for well over a century. I've got <laughs> almost uh, as long as photography was around. I, I think actually it predates photography. People were drawing in three D yeah. bef before the camera, um, and I've got uh, an antique stereoscope that's at least 150 years old. So. To take it to a more modern approach, I mean, yes, we had the fad of 3D TVs, and then you had to wear these glasses, and there was eye strain issues. Um, but if you ever saw a really well-produced 3D image, as I show people, even just bringing up the images on my phone and putting it into an antique stereoscope, some people swear with delight. It's not often you get profanity as a compliment for something. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and so that, yeah, that told me, okay, you know, you're onto something here. Uh, there's a company that um, that made some 3D macro lenses um, uh, called DeWidges, and they were based in um, the Netherlands, I believe. Uh, they're, they're not making them anymore. They come up once in a while on eBay. I've gotten four of them that way. Oh. And uh, they ha they basically have two lenses in the same barrel. 
and uh, and then that divides all the way back to the sensor, splitting the image in half, uh, one for each eye. And then I usually crop it in square to be a more traditional format. Um, and uh, so I can photograph like an, an insect in flight or a freezing soap bubble as it's actively closing. Um, and uh, when you see that in 3D, it's, it's just wonderful. Uh, and I know there's no big market for it, but I just love doing it because it keeps me passionate about my own work. Um, but, but I'm also thinking there might be a market for it that could be growing. Um, I'm not sure, Chris, if you're familiar with uh, RED cameras and their yes, hydrogen project that is currently um, in development, where it's a smartphone that has a uh, no glasses required, they say a holographic 3D display, and it's capable of shooting 3D images on it as well. So uh, I think that we, we are on the precipice of something very interesting here. And, have you uh, have you tried video, three uh, D video that way, macro video? Uh, I haven't, only because um, my uh, I, I would love to shoot four K video, and then that gives you maybe about uh, ten eighty uh, HD per eye. Um, but all of my cameras that shoot four K video crop in on the sensor, uh -huh. and and that breaks the stereo window because you're losing too much from each eye on the opposite sides. Um, and if you shoot ten eighty, then the resolution just isn't big enough. But it's on my radar, and the next cameras that I get will probably have that capability. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm just in my, uh, in front of my inner eye. I'm looking into the future, and we are definitely going to have things on our faces soon that we we'll look through that have the capability of giving us 3D images everywhere we go. Well, and you know the the glassless 3D tech has been around for a while. I mean, Nintendo's had it in their 3DS oh, yeah. for a very long time, um, and I think some other sm smartphones have done. Um, that kind of thing that never really caught on because it was based on lenticular technology, um, which is a pretty poor way to do it. Um, I think but everyone Red knows has... lenticular, right? From from these uh, postcards that you wiggle left and right. That's pretty much what we're talking about here. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so you could uh, either change the angle of view on something when you're moving it around or an animation will occur. People have used these in, uh, in billboards and things like that too. But... Um, uh, the, the the new technology coming is going to push this, I think, back to the forefront. And I'm I maybe taking a gamble, but I'd love to be riding that wave and having a uh, a catalog of really fun images to share uh, and to just you know have fun. Well, if if it pays off, uh, if it, if it if it if it works out this way, it will certainly pay off because you'll be the first. And if it doesn't, then you had something to keep yourself busy with and create some really beautiful stuff there. And, you know, it, it's fun when I mix it into the other uh, crazy experiments that I do. Like, uh, I've been playing around a lot with ultraviolet photography. And if I can take a 3D image uh, in ultraviolet, it just becomes so otherworldly. It's like something out of a science fiction movie that you can't believe is real. And to <laughs> me, that that that's my goal as a photographer, to kind of make you question reality. So you, you've, been, you've been playing with the edges of the spectrum and... I think most people are familiar with infrared photography, um, especially the infrared photography where you cut out the visible light, so you end up with only the infrared light, and that makes these um, what's it called the wood effect, the, the the effect where like green in trees turns white and looks like a snowscape well, not just almost. Um, we have um, like a lot of purple maples here, and they'll turn just as bright. Awesome. Um, <laughs> and uh, so anything that produces photosynthesis will really glow. And it doesn't really have a strong connection to the visible light colors themselves. Right. The sky becomes dark and uh, water becomes quite dark. It, it has a really, uh, a really wonderful effect. But um, so, in, so the uh, other end of the spectrum is ultraviolet. Uh, what yeah, happens and it's there? harder to exp uh, explore because a lot of lenses um, will block or otherwise absorb ultraviolet light. So it's the glass itself that can become a problem. Um, and uh, there's a, a guy I found on uh, on eBay that uh, found some. Uh, antiquated lenses that uh, behave quite nicely for this and so a hundred dollars can get you uh, an appropriate lens and uh, you get your camera converted to full spectrum uh, so that there's no filters in front of uh, in front of the sensor that would otherwise block infrared or ultraviolet and then you place some filters on the front of the lens that uh, block out 
everything but ultraviolet. And this is a hard thing to do because most of the commercially available filters will still leak in like 1% of infrared light. But that can be equal to the amount of ultraviolet light you're collecting as well and can really contaminate the, um, uh, the images. So I use some filters uh, under, under the brand X-Nite, uh, X-N-I-T-E. Um, and uh, there's two filter combinations that uh, give you the perfect connection. This creates a camera that can directly see ultraviolet light. Now, insects can also see ultraviolet light, and flowers uh, have evolved to take advantage of this. And there are patterns in certain flowers, uh, bullseyes or, you know, like uh, running light strips as, as like a landing strip at a runway for an insect <laughs> to follow and kind of find its way right into the pollen. And they're completely invisible to us. But with an ultraviolet camera, you can, you can capture them. And uh, it's interesting just to see what's kind of hidden under our noses. But... That's um, it. It has its limits because not all flowers behave properly. There's uh, a lot of subjects that just don't reveal anything of interest. Um, but when you use ultraviolet light in a fluorescence perspective, that's where it becomes really fascinating because. If I have, and I've built these uh, these custom ultraviolet flashes, uh, it's not a hard thing to do. It's about five minutes of work once you get the right pieces. Um, it'll emit only ultraviolet light. The same sort of technology as you know putting the filters in the camera. You just put the filters in front of the flash instead. And you'd be surprised how many things fluoresce. A lot of people realize that. So fl uh, fluorescence is fluorescence is when you shine ultraviolet light on something, and it will emit visible light then, right? Exactly. So uh, people that uh, that live in an area where there are scorpions, they will have an ultraviolet light to make sure that there's no scorpions in their house or their garage hmm. uh, because scorpions are known to fluoresce quite heavily. Um, but a lot of things, flowers and insects, uh, will glow, um, again, in that kind of science fiction kind of uh, you know beauty. And uh, I was just playing around with, uh, you know, some some flowers, uh, like I think it's about a bee balm or some variety of that that was just glowing in a whole rainbow of colors. And then there was a spider on it that was glowing green. And, uh, and so this is a shot that I just made yesterday. But um, you'd be surprised how much fun it can be to just ask yourself, what if? And uh, and just go and grab a bunch of flowers and see which ones, uh, you know, the pollen specifically in a lot of flowers will glow very brightly. Because it tries to attract itself. the insects, right? Well, uh, fluorescence is different because fluorescence can never be seen naturally. There's no ultraviolet only light source that would then give out into the visible spectrum. Um, it might be related to how it's absorbing uh, ultraviolet light, but it's giving it back into the visible spectrum. So um, yeah, it's so much fun to explore. And you know, the, I, the rabbit hole just doesn't end. It just keeps going. I mean, again, you then combined the ultraviolet photography with, uh, with the freezing bubbles. How did that go? Yeah, yeah, you can combine these different things together. Um, and so in, in one example, uh, I decided I was going to try and take a, um, a mixture of, of bubbles and, um, and add in something that would make it fluoresce. So I, uh, I just went out and I found some ready-made bubble solution that uh, fluoresced. I guess they make it for nightclubs or raves or whatever. Oh, black light, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, and, uh, and then I added in some ultraviolet fluorescing powder. And that powder, unfortunately, was not soluble into whatever the bubble solution was. And so my first attempt was a complete failure until I discovered that uh, they make invisible ink in little three ounce bottles designed to fill up a fountain pen or something with. <laughs> if you wanted to write secret messages, yeah, they, they sell this stuff. Um, and so then I took that and I mixed it into my bubble solution and it worked perfectly. And the idea was to make the bubble look like it was glowing from within. And uh, first attempt right off the bat with that new solution, I, I got the shot. And, uh, and they're beautiful. You know, thank you. Uh, it's something that I don't think anybody had done before. So I feel pretty good about, uh, uh, about what I was able to create. But still, I got to push it farther. And uh, other uh, liquids, uh, artificial liquids will fluoresce like highlighter ink will typically glow whatever its color is. So you can make these wild and wonderful combinations. I actually want to do some um, water droplet collision work. 
uh, with different fluorescing colors and just make a, a splashing kind of rainbow effect just glowing everywhere. Uh, too many ideas, Chris. Too many ideas. <laughs> Not enough time. But um, the one thing that you spend your time is you, you're making this this crazy experimentation available to others as well in your workshops. So I, I um, do, yeah. What, what, are, what are the things that are coming up there? So I, I just, uh, I've, I've got some workshops coming up this uh, this weekend after we record. They're already booked, but um, I'm doing an infrared workshop in uh, in Princeton, New Jersey, and that's in September. Uh, I have um, the Mike Motes Macro Photography Conference, and that's in October, uh, and a lot of other ones that I'll do here in my own studio. If anybody wants to learn how to turn a water droplet into a lens and see uh, a, a flower just beautifully appear inside of every water droplet in an image. Uh, I do uh, workshops here all the time uh, with that. And you can find that again at my website at uh, doncom.ca. And if you want to play with the crazy ultraviolet stuff, I, I don't do group sessions with that because uh, it's a little bit hazardous and there's only so much equipment to go around. But I do book one-on-one -on -one private workshops and uh, you can kind of follow me down that rabbit hole as far as, you, uh, as you'd like. Awesome. So what's up next other than that? Do you have any plans for future experimentation? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, right now I'm, I'm uh, printing for an art show. So uh, I've been in full on print mode. My studio is converted into, uh, you know, you've got the cutters and scraps of paper and frames and everything all <laughs> over the place. Um, but as soon as that's out of the way, I want to start experimenting a little bit more in, um, in, in pushing into video. Uh, with some of these ideas because, I mean, you mentioned the 3D video, but I've done a lot of work for documentary films uh, over the past couple of years. And uh, they're always looking for something that is unique, kind of pushing the limits. Um, and uh, we talked about ultraviolet. I shot a, an ultraviolet opening for the Discovery documentary called Mosquito. Um, and uh, I, was, I was really happy with how they utilized the, the footage there. And Discovery also just came to my studio recently and filmed three mini documentary um, episodes of a show called Don't Blink. These are six to eight minute documentary films. Um, if anybody's been intrigued by what we've talked about here today, Chris, maybe you could put a, a link in the show notes. I'll, I'll send you the link. It's freely watchable worldwide on Facebook. Of course. Uh, and uh, one's on snowflakes, one's on freezing soap bubbles, and the other's on ultraviolet. So it fits in pretty perfectly. Cool. So uh, we'll have links in the show notes to your website, to the podcast, Photo Geek Weekly, and of course, to what you just talked about, the Don't Blink documentaries. Um, Don, thank you so much for coming on the show. This is very, very exciting stuff. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much for giving me this little soapbox to stand on and talk about. And that was it for today's episode of Tips from the Top Floor. Thank you so much for listening. If you liked the episode, let me know by giving the show a rating on iTunes or by supporting it in any other way, like Patreon or word of mouth. Tips from the Top Floor depends on your support and every little helps. I remember that I More at tfttf.com slash support. Thank you so much. Music for the show by Jeff Smith, sound partner Hans Peter Kagurut Publishing, and Slack challenges by Release Pixie Mad, Rusty Dark Arm Set, Slack Imitations by Chief Invitation Officer, CIO Rusty Russ. The link to get on the Slack is in the show notes. My name's Chris Marquardt. You'll find me on social media at Chris M A R Q U A R D T. Go out and take amazing photos. Be nice to each other. And happy shooting.